Bruce Nelson. Uh, Bruce Nelson uh, works at West Marine. He was over at Sausalito store. Uh, he's now at the Richmond store. And Bruce is the electronics expert. So Bruce is going to kind of bring us up to speed here on some new things going on in the electronics and battery world. So welcome, Bruce. How are you doing? Thanks very much. Uh, well, I'm really excited about this topic. I learned to sail when I was in high school. And uh, <clears throat> then in between, I was in deserts a long time. So uh, over the decades now, my wife and I are living on a sailboat and uh, we're really enjoying things. And, um, you know, when you're on a house, uh, you often don't think too much about the wiring and the plumbing and the other systems. But uh, on a boat, especially if you're uh, traveling, you kind of become uh, responsible for taking care of them. And uh, for me, this is one of the, the interesting things about being on a boat is to learn all about the, the systems and uh, even planning to set them up. So the first thing that I'd like to talk about are the batteries. Uh, batteries are, you know, used to be really considered old technology, although there's a lot happening. And uh, for a, a boat owner, there's basically two types to think about. One is uh, the start batteries for starting your engine. And then the second type is the deep cycle batteries uh, which are used to keep the systems up when you don't have shore power or a generator running. Uh, in terms of chemistry, uh, we have several different types. The one that's been in use the longest are the flooded batteries, and especially a type called traction batteries, uh, of which uh, rolls might be one of the, uh, the old time versions, uh, are still a good choice. Uh, they last a long time, they do the job well, uh, they are heavy and uh, they're not inexpensive, but uh, I think they're still uh, worth it for keeping your systems up and running. Uh, a newer type is called a, a gel battery and I no longer really recommend the gel batteries for most boaters anymore. Uh, they didn't used to require as much maintenance but there's a new type now called absorbed glass mat or AGM batteries, which uh, are sometimes even cheaper than the gel batteries, but uh, they can do very well in both deep cycle and start applications. Uh, they tend to be somewhat cheaper and they're not nearly as sensitive to the charging technology as uh, AGMs. Uh, gel batteries, if the charging current is too high, which could often happen for a number of reasons, if you have solar panels, for instance, uh, the, and they're not well controlled with a voltage regulator, you can get enough voltage that hydrogen batter bubbles start coming off the uh, plates and those bubbles push the, the gel away and the battery loses capacity and may never recover. So they're quite sensitive to their use. Uh, so my recommendation for most people now is to go with AGM batteries. There's two types, uh, general types, uh, depending on the, uh, uh, the chemistry of the battery. Uh, the ones that have been most widely on the market uh, have either calcium or antimony allied uh, with the lead in the plates. And uh, there's another kind that's called a pure lead battery. Uh, the, just to give you a little history, these were developed when they were looking for a battery system for the F-16 fighter. And uh, at the time, none of the current lead acid batteries could maintain the G-forces that uh, were uh, imposed on the fighter. And so a company called Gates Rubber got a DARPA contract to do the research. Uh, they uh, got the idea of putting fiberglass plates between the, the battery, fiberglass plates between the lead plates and uh, have the electrolyte absorbed in the fiberglass. And that actually turned out working really well. But somebody was thinking, normally pure lead can't be used because it's too soft. And of course, in the plane, it would bend. And it's soft enough that even in normal use, it, it would bend and not be dimensionally stable. 
So uh, what they uh, decided, maybe that's not the case if we put it in the fiberglass and they would squeeze the plates into a solid block and uh, that ended up not only working mechanically, but pure lead has a much lower <laughs> resistance than the lead alloys. And so it turned out making a better battery. Uh, several reasons for that. One was uh, it could deliver a lot more amps into a load because of the lower resistance. So it makes it an even start better starting battery than what the current, the previous batteries had been. And um, it uh, also turned out it would cycle deeply more times uh, than the standard lead alloy batteries. So uh, if you're cycling the battery uh, down to only 20% of the uh, remaining capacity and then recharging it, uh, you could do about uh, 400 times with a battery like this. If you took a standard flooded uh, du dual purpose uh, or deep cycle battery, you might only be looking at 100 to 200 times. So the amount of service of a battery like this in that application is much higher. And the, uh, because of the low, uh, the, the low resistance, it can actually deliver thousands of pulse amps into a starter uh, if your battery cables are, are thick enough and uh, do a really wonderful job of starting your, your engine even after they're old. Now for all of these battery types, uh, the length of service of the battery is quite dependent on the temperature that the batteries are stored, stored at. So um, if you have batteries in right next to a diesel engine where it's hot all the time, the life of the battery is going to be significantly shorter than it will if it's in the bilges where it's more cool. This uh, also uh, makes a difference for somebody keeping their boat up in Sacramento where it's in the hundreds during the day compared to down in Sausalito, for instance, or down here in the Bay where it's exposed to much uh, lower temperatures. And this can either lengthen or shorten the battery life by three or four times just based on the temperature they're stored at. So um, the one of these types of batteries would be my recommendation normally. Uh, there's a, a trope about batteries that kind of says you should use the largest battery bank that you can afford so you're cycling it down less and the batteries last longer. Well, that's kind of true in terms of the number of cycles you get. But if you look at the life of the battery over its use, if you're cycling it deeper, you're using more of the battery capacity. And if you look at the matter of the number of amps that the battery is delivering over its lifetime, you actually might be getting a lot more amps out of your battery bank over the time you've used it with a smaller bank that's cycling more deeply. And this is especially true of the AGMs. And because using fewer batteries is going to both cost less and weigh less, uh, in some cases, if you're replacing a standard bank with an AGM bank, you, you don't need two different types for your uh, start and your deep cycle batteries. And this may be a way to uh, save some weight, some cost, and increase the performance over the life of your battery system. Um, <clears throat> of course, the battery systems are going to be directly tied to the methods that you have to charge. In the old days, the primary way of charging the batteries was to use the engine when you would run it. Um, the biggest issue with that is that if you're out cruising uh, and the batteries will charge fairly rapidly up to about 80% of charge, but then the acceptance charge acceptance of the battery begins to level off. And that means for that last 20% of uh, battery charge, you'd have, you'd be using a great deal of extra fuel and also uh, uh, putting a lot of wear on your engine. Uh, but if you don't bring it all the way up, then when the battery sits, these are the lead acid batteries, when they sit uh, at partly empty charge, uh, calcium sulfate tends to form on the plates and they form uh, uh, it's insoluble and the battery life goes down. 
So a uh, battery sitting around with no use will self-discharge and um, eventually go bad even if it was never used. So one of the answers to this dilemma is adding solar panels. And the solar panels, of course, uh, are probably putting fewer amps in than a, a engine charger at full speed, but uh, they can top up that last 20% without uh, causing uh, damage to the engine. So coupled with the engine runtime, solar panels are a good choice. Uh, if you're in an anchorage someplace where you don't want to run that engine at all, then having um, uh, the uh, either a genset or a wind generator, or if you're passage making, even a tow generator would be other ways of getting those amperages to keep your batteries uh, charged. Uh, the, the other thing I should mention about sizing your battery bank is that you need to understand how much power you're going to be using from the batteries in a typical day. And the way to do that is look at all the systems that you have on the boat, uh, add up the number of amps per every hour that it's used, and then set, size your batteries to be able to meet that kind of need. Uh, Nigel Calder has a couple books on uh, battery systems. You'll also find a number of other books on battery systems which have worksheets that uh, explain how to work that out. And there's also uh, a lot of the local uh, system engineers can also do that for you. But it's kind of fun to put the pencil on the paper yourself and uh, work out those sizes. And it's certainly with the help of a book like that is something that you could do. Um, so the there's a, a new technology that's starting to become <clears throat> almost to the mature point. And uh, that's what Tesla is using in their cars and now some other car makers, and that's the lithium ion battery technology. Uh, there's some really good things about lithium ion. One is it's starting to hit the mass market. So they're, as they're being uh, produced in quantity, the price is dropping very quickly. And uh, they're also very light, there may be it depends on the packaging, but maybe a fifth of the weight of uh, lead acid batteries. Wow, that's significant. It's really significant. If you're a racer, even at this point, that's almost a no-brainer because you'll see uh, the amount of weight that you'll save will add significant speed to your boat, especially if you're passage making. Um, the, uh, the, the small caveat I have is that because this technology is new, uh, and especially cheap uh, lithium ion batteries uh, have been a fire risk. Uh, you have, may, may have heard about uh, some of the, uh, the hoverboards and other cheap uh, products, or even then the cell phones, which are made in big, uh, uh, big quantities. Uh, a fire in a cell phone in your pocket is no good, uh, but uh, if you have it in your battery system on the boat, then that's, uh, that could be a disaster. And even on the new, some of the new Boeing aircraft that were relying on uh, lithium batteries, they've had some fire issues with those. So we're just about there, and I'm pretty sure we're on the way to getting those problems solved, but it's still a caveat that I have. Um, one of the makers that uses a, a lithium phosphate technology that's uh, quite fire safe is Torquedo. I believe their batteries are probably uh, uh, 24 volt. They, they may have some, uh, some 12s now as well, but uh, a lot of their batteries are 24. Uh, the cost is still relatively high, but because of the, the weight and the fact that they can also deliver lots of amps um, and they, they, don't, um, uh, they don't sulfate, if they sit in a discharge state. So there's a lot of potential advantages to these lithium batteries. And I think they're worth considering uh, and maybe very shortly, even in a matter of, of months. Now, the, we don't know because the economy is not suddenly in an unpredictable state. It's hard to know what's going to happen with prices, but it's definitely something that you might want to consider on your horizon. Uh, another factor 
on voltage is we're starting to see DC to DC converters. So you could use uh, higher voltage battery banks, uh, maybe even into the hundreds of volts, which means all the wires in your boat can be much smaller. So you're saving cost and weight in there. And then if your devices are using 12 volts, use another DC to DC converter to bring that power back down. Uh, we're certainly seeing it on some newer boats. Uh, a lot of them will keep it to 48 volts to stay intrinsically safe. But it's another thing I would watch for if I'm planning a, a, a new system on a boat. So um, that's a quick overview on the batteries. By the way, if uh, I think you can let us know if you have any questions as I go along. And uh, I would be glad to try and answer those here uh, during the talk if uh, any are forwarded. So the next uh, thing I want to talk about is now that we've got all this power, what do we use it for? Probably the most important thing would be the safety systems. Uh, safety on a boat, it's pretty hard to enjoy uh, your experience if it's not safe. And we have a lot of modern electronics now that are adding to safety. The, the very first item probably would be uh, a VHF, in, turn, in the electronic terms, would be a VHF marine radio. Now we're going to get into a whole lot of alphabet soup here, and you don't really have to remember it, but I'll try and tell you what these things mean. Uh, VHF stands for very high frequency, and uh, then you have UHF, which is ultra high that goes above that. But the typical marine radios that uh, we have are designed for short range communication between boats. You can, uh, uh, with a handheld, you can expect to go maybe three or four miles to another boat on the water to perhaps as much as 25 or 30 to the Coast Guard, which has very tall antennas. Um, for a, a masthead um, head, uh, antenna that's up high, then uh, 25 to 30 miles is uh, certainly possible, uh, certainly to the Coast Guard, but, but uh, 25, 20, 25 miles, depending on the height of the antennas to other boats. Uh, so that's a VHF Marine. There's uh, another system where now you can get radios that have a GPS, which is the Global Positioning System satellite information. So the radio knows what the position is. And uh, there's a number called an MMSI number, which stands for Marine Mobile Service uh, ID. And when you register your radio with the Coast Guard on the Marine uh, Mobile Service ID, then when they hear a call, or especially an emergency call, they know who you are. And then there's a system called DSC, which stands for D Digital Selective Calling. You press that emergency button on your radio, you don't even have to say anything. And all the boats in the area and either the Coast Guard or if you're on an inland lake, uh, could be the uh, Sheriff's Department. The, the local authorities will know that you have a marine emergency and they'll know who you are. And if you filed a float plan or something like that, they'll even have more detail. So uh, when you get those radios, be sure to go and register your uh, MMSI number. And uh, even uh, if you're going out on a dinghy or a, um, a paddleboard or a, a kayak, something like that, that can be a life-saving device. <laughs> Hey, Bruce, yes. um, we sell a lot of boats and a lot of these boats already have a device, whether it's a radio or whatever, yeah. with an MMSI number already in it. Mm -hmm. How do you change it? Okay, uh, there's, there's a couple ways. If you're going to Mexico or Canada, you need to contact the Coast Guard to get it taken care of. Within the U.S., uh, Boat U.S. handles those registrations. And if you're a Boat U.S. member, which uh, West Marine Gold members already are, then it's free to go in and, and uh, get your MMSI number changed. In fact, in that case, you can just go online and uh, do it on the website. You just put in your new information and, uh, and your new MMSI number. And if you have multiple radios or multiple boats, 
the same owner would just use the same MMSI number because it's uh, ID to him. So, uh, good question. Yeah, thanks. Um, so some of the other uh, safety systems, uh, another important one if you're uh, going offshore is called an EPIRB. That stands for an electronic position indicating radio beacon. Uh, I believe they were first developed for aircraft, but they've been in use in the marine world for a long time. Uh, I've actually had two friends who've been saved by EPIRBs in the last, say, three years or so. Uh, one coming down the coast of, uh, uh, of California. Uh, she uh, had gotten a catamaran, and her dad insisted that she not leave port without an EPIRB, and she didn't have one. So uh, she found out she was able to rent one from uh, Boat US and had it on the boat when she flipped off Fort Bragg. And uh, that was the thing that uh, without anybody being able to manually go and set off an alarm, uh, it automatically uh, uh, activated and uh, they were able to save everybody on board. So that was quite a uh, experience. I haven't. How, how about uh, using a spot or in reach? They do the same thing, right? No, nah, not exactly. <laughs> uh, so I was going to get to those type of uh, devices as well. Uh, the uh, spot and in reach are also satellite communication systems. It is possible to contact emergency systems with either one of those. Spot uses um, uh, TV broadcast satellites. Uh, and so since the market for the TV broadcast is near the continent, uh, if you're within a couple hundred miles of the shore, you're probably going to be able to make that work. Uh, as you get further away, the time length to get a text lengthens. Uh, you know, it might, even for a text, it might take, uh, if you're out of the main footprint, it might take uh, uh, let's say half an hour to actually even get transmitted. And if you're going to Hawaii, for instance, you're going to be in a completely dead spot where a, a spot communication device won't be able to communicate at all. Uh, uh, the, uh, the inReach system uses the Iridium satellites. And so that's usable everywhere in the world, but you're still, they still have to report to the same uh, rescue systems once they get a, um, a, a message. And uh, also, both of those, you're paying a subscription fee uh, uh, every month, whereas uh, with the EPIRB, there's no subscription. Once you've uh, registered it, it's, it's good. So you pay for that with your taxes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So uh, as a backup, especially if you want to do some two-way messaging, then I would say... Uh, either the spot or the, uh, the um, inReach are well worth considering, but um, it certainly should not replace an EPIRB. Couple other items, there's a PLB, which uses the same, that stands for personal, personal locator beacon. Uh, it uses the same technology system as the uh, EPIRB, but they're smaller, they're designed to be worn on a, a, a life vest and um, I have some friends who like to go skiing in the wintertime and uh, they will carry them in their cars. And if they're doing any off-roading and get stuck, that can keep them from being stuck in a snowbank for, uh, you know, a couple days uh, because they can still alert the, uh, the satellite. And um, uh, it, so it, it's effective in situations of that kind as well. Uh, VHF radios, by the way, aren't allowed to, uh, li generally speaking, aren't allowed to be used uh, in cars, for instance, or on shore systems. Although there is a, a now, if you have something like that and you're in an emergency situation and it can be life-saving, then you've got a, a free pass. You can use anything, any means you have available in any case. Uh, this would also be true if you had a ham radio that you weren't allowed to transmit on, that you just wanted to listen to ham nets. But in an emergency, if that's what you had to communicate with, uh, it would be okay to use. So um, 
uh, once you're in a real need, they're pretty lean, lenient about the systems that they uh, that they allow. Hey, Bruce, let me just uh, break in real quick yeah. here, just to uh, reintroduce Bruce for anybody that just came on. Um, this is Bruce Nelson from uh, West Marine, and also he's a salesman for Atomic Tuna talking about electronics. Um, so yeah, so back to Bruce. And hey, Bruce, maybe we can talk about some of the new um, multifunction displays and what you like and is... Uh, is uh, Simrad better than Ray Marine or? Okay, uh, so the multifunction displays are the big screens that you see in the cockpits and uh, they call them MFDs or multifunction because they can do so many things depending on what they're hooked up to. Uh, the main brands that you're going to be uh, seeing are B&G, Simrad and Lawrence which are all made by the same company. So the peripherals will talk to those. Um, so if you had a, a radar that was a Lawrence radar, for instance, it would still talk with Simrad or BNG. This company has been in business for over 60 years. And as a result, especially for sailors, they're somewhat uh, uh, more developed. Uh, so, for masthead sensors and also for radars right now, there's small uh, advantages to those, uh, those systems. Um, Garmin is another good large company. They don't come from a sailing background. They're located in Kansas. And I consider the quality of the Garmin stuff really high, but sometimes the execution in terms of uh, marine specific stuff uh, can be a little lacking. The biggest problem there is proprietary nature of things like charts. Uh, last year, there was a big difference. Uh, Garmin has purchased the um, uh, Navionics uh, charting system, which is a good chart database. So now the new Garmin charts are good, but you still have to buy the chip uh, from Garmin for their systems. If you have a, a, an avionics chip for a Ray Marine or a BNG, it's not gonna work in your Garmin. Uh, the uh, Ray Marine has been popular for a long time since they came from uh, Raytheon. Uh, they were purchased by FLIR, the night vision company a few years ago. And uh, they had a period where they were floundering a little bit uh, and some of their uh, customer support wasn't maybe the best it could have been. Uh, that's been pretty well fixed for a couple of years, but uh, I understand they might be on the market again. So I'm a little uh, uncertain about how they're going to be going forward. The, uh, the other thing, Ray Marine has had proprietary communications, their Ray, RayNet, so you often couldn't take uh, a unit from another supplier and plug it into a Ray Marine system without an adapter. Uh, the company's been moving in the direction of becoming much more um, uh, universal. And in fact, the operating systems on their, uh, on their uh, multifunction displays is basically Android, uh, Linux. So if you're a programmer or know somebody in the Bay Area, a lot of your um, Android applications like Netflix or things like that will run right on your Raymarine chart plotter. So that's a, a pretty nice thing. And if you're technical, it might be a, a reason to be a little more open than some of the others. Um, the um, the uh, BNG um, wind sensors are both more accurate and more sensitive than uh, sensors from the others. Um, radar. Uh, there's a small advantage to the um, uh, the BNG Simrad radars. Uh, now, as as the technology moves forward, these companies may leapfrog in their in their features. So uh, uh, don't assume that what's true today is going to be a, a true next year on that. But uh, that's kind of my evaluation. And they're so good right now, I wouldn't uh, think you would make a mistake having any one of them on your boat. Uh, one other brand I did not mention 
is um, the uh, uh, Pruno. Pruno is basically in the in the large boat market. Uh, to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, if you were looking at just this sensor for a fish finder on a Fruno, you might be looking at eighty thousand dollars. You know, as much as <laughs> as, as your boat. Um, so, if you're really serious on both radars and and fish finders for commercial use, you might be looking at Fruno. But uh, for where most of us are in the recreational market, that's where we are. Uh, the uh, Communications, most people have moved to what's called NMEA, uh, which is the 2000 is the marine version of CAN bus, which means you can take all of your engine data uh, in on modern engines and uh, display them on your display. Uh, the older 0183 is the old RS-232 set standard. So even on old equipment, you can get those into a modern unit using NMEA. Uh, Ethernet uh, for images coming from uh, uh, fish finders or uh, radar, other things that are uh, high, uh, high data showing images, they may need to be proprietary to the company that makes them. And uh, finally, I just want to briefly mention that your your MFD can also be the center of an entertainment system. Uh, you can get Cirrus FM, or you can get um, uh, uh, Fusion Audio, which is now owned by Garmin, and use your, uh, your multifunction display as a center for uh, controlling your audio systems. Um, the controller can also do your autopilots, and we now have auto routing from most of the manufacturers. And to give you an idea of how sophisticated this has gotten, uh, if you have FM satellite weather data coming in, you can set a route on your chart plotter, uh, invoke the auto routing. And let's say you have a waypoint that's 19 hours in advance. And we know that the tides and the wind are going to be predicted to change and the currents over that time period. The system will take the forecasted conditions as you move along your route and set your uh, waypoints to steer to based on those predictions. So it, it can really take some of the load off your passage planning. Uh, you don't wanna disengage your brain uh, while you're doing this, but it can make this type of use uh, much easier. I thought that's what the purpose was. <laughs> uh, you know, there, there's too many cautionary tales. Uh, in the last uh, around the world race, uh, one of the professional navigators uh, ran aground on a well-charted uh, reef uh, because he said, go from here to here without checking for the water depth in between. And, uh, you know, he was tired. I don't really blame him for that. <laughs> They'd been up for days with very little sleep, but uh, you still have to think these are two make your life easier, not to turn your life over to them and, and uh, have them get you in trouble. Got a question. Yeah. Can a PLB be a good replacement for an EPERB? E -perb. I would not recommend it. Uh, if you, uh, the, the active life on the PLB may only be uh, 24 to 48 hours. And especially if you're passage making, that may not be enough to get you located and found. So uh, while it works with the same systems, your EPIRB is going to have a, a, a stronger output, a stronger battery, work longer, have more likelihood of being picked up. So I would strongly recommend that as an addition. So the reason is that um, battery life is shorter on the PLB? Yes, yes. Uh, there's another electronic device which uses the AIS system, which is the uh, uh, automatic identification system that all commercial boats have to carry. And uh, so if you have an AIS receiver on your boat, which works on the VHF frequencies, you can see all the commercial traffic around you. More and more recreational boats are putting these in too. They're relatively inexpensive. If you have an AIS transmitter on your uh, life jacket, if you go in the water, 
anybody around with an EIS receiver will know you're in the water. Uh, they'll know where you are. The IS display will have an arrow on the display pointing in the direction you're in. So anybody who even isn't well trained can maybe find you in, in seas because their uh, AIS signal is uh, letting uh, everybody around know first you're in the water and secondly where you are. So Bruce, all cruising boats or most cruising boats, they put radar, radar on the boat. And now we have AIS. Do you need radar? Uh, there are things that radar won't, that AIS won't help you with. Uh, if you're uh, making a, a shorefall, uh, uh, for instance, a landfall, uh, the radar will probably tell you where you are in relation to the rocks, which AIS will not. Uh, there's still a lot of boats out there that don't have AIS. Um, so it's not a substitute. It just uh, helps you uh, manage. One nice thing about AIS is uh, your display will give the call letters of the ship that you're talking to. A lot of the bridges won't uh, monitor their radios, but if you call them by their call letters or the ship, the name of the ship, which you have on your AIS display, they'll answer. I guess they're, they're legally obligated to answer, is that right? Yeah, I think so. <clears throat> well, in the old days, we used to use radar a lot to navigate, but now we have electronic charts. Um, the electronic charts are only as good as the data that goes into them. <laughs> and uh, there's something called a datum, which uh, the charts are drawn to, and they're not all in the same, uh, <laughs> the same thing. So you can get a four or five mile error because you have the wrong datum on the chart uh, compared to what the, I what the GPS is reading. And, um, and in addition, especially in the South Pacific, a lot of the islands aren't exactly in their charted positions. So radar can help you out with that, whereas the chart you have to take with a grain of salt. And I heard there was a new island out there the last couple of years yep. that popped up out of nowhere. That happens uh, not that infrequently, actually, in volcanic areas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> all right, well, we, um, we heard from Bruce about batteries and uh, personal devices um, and M MFDs or multifunctional devices, safety electronics. Um, anybody have a quick question or two for him? I might just say that in terms of satellite communication, uh, over the next two to three years, I expect that that game is going to change. Uh, some of you may know that uh, uh, Starlink is launching thousands of satellites and uh, probably late this year, you'll be able to buy receivers that you might be able to put on your boat and have relatively inexpensive internet uh, anywhere in the world. So that is something that's, uh, that's coming. Might be, it's first going to be in the US, Canada will probably be next, and then uh, it'll expand out. But uh, there's several other companies that are working on similar systems. So that's another factor that's on the way, but not quite here yet. All right. Well, can't wait for that. Um, yeah, thanks, Bruce. That was great. Uh, if anybody has questions for Bruce, you can reach him at bruce at atomictunayachts.com. Call us up, shoot us an email, whatever, and uh, we can get your questions to Bruce. Uh, he's happy to talk to you as well. What's your phone number, Bruce? Uh, yeah, you can call me directly at 510-734-0700. Uh, One more question. Any comments on KVH LTE1 or improved Wi Fi? Uh, if you're going to be using it right now, uh, that could be a, a, a good immediate solution for you. Uh, you're looking at considerably higher cost uh, than some of these new systems that are coming on. So I think they're quickly going to be obsolete. That's my feeling. Uh, also for uh, television, some of these uh, systems might 
be uh, reasonable. How he's letting other people All right, cool. Thanks, Bruce. Um, we'll uh, revisit this with you maybe in another month or two, or you know, keep up on what's new in electronics. And uh, appreciate you coming right, by and uh, talking to everybody. Um, <clears throat>